In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome, my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, to this program entitled, Learning to Live in God's Divine Will. We are all students in this catechesis of God through Louisa, the servant of God, so that we may become, like Louisa, sons of the Most High, harbingers of peace, disposing in these end times the world for the era of peace. So this program will be on our ability, given by God, to help dispose the world and souls for this great era of his divine will of peace on earth. Let us begin with a prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Last week's broadcast touched upon the presence and power of evil in these end times that tries to negate the grace of God and the power of his grace at work within us. And we talked about the Blessed Virgin Mary forming a cohort, a white army, her offspring, who will, in these end times, as children of light fight the good fight against evil with her, and with her crush the infernal serpent's head. Now, the victory is Christ's, we know that already, but this is in the mind of God. It's not yet in time and space. This guaranteed victory in Scripture of Christ over Satan has to be played out within time and space. That is, within the members of the mystical body of Christ, who are us. So we have a very important role in these end times. And remember, even though it is prophesied that God wins in the end, that Christ defeats Satan in the end, at the general judgment, when Satan is definitively cast into hell, never to emerge again, prophecy depends upon our response. Let us not forget this. There are passages in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, where God said something, but it was modified. For example, let's take Job. God said that within 40 days, Nineveh would be destroyed. But it wasn't. Because the people changed, they reformed, they converted. And this is because... Job preached to them. So Job was given a commandment by God to preach to the Ninevites. And another example is from Ezekiel, um, where we find that um, God does not derive any pleasure from the death of the wicked, but rather rejoices that he in turn, that is the wicked in turn, reform from his evil way and live. So for this reason, God, although telling Jonah that Nineveh would be destroyed, withheld his wrath. There are other examples in Scripture where it appears that God's prophecy changed, but it really didn't, you see. It was dependent upon man's conversion or lack thereof. And we must also be mindful that even though the victory is Christ's in God's mind, it is up to us to carry out this divine plan in time and space that is in our human natures. We are called, therefore, like Louisa, to become victim souls, to offer ourselves to God. And the concept of victim soul does not necessarily mean you're a mystic like Louisa with extraordinary gifts. It means that you're giving your will to God unconditionally, knowing 
that he will never take more than what you offer, more than what he knows he needs from you. Jesus tells Louisa on September 4th, 1905 in Volume 6, This is the order of my providence, of my justice, and of my love. With each epoch, I must have at least one soul with whom to share all the blessings I possess, and that soul must give me everything it owes me in its capacity. Otherwise, why maintain the world? In one moment, I would demolish it. This is precisely why I choose victim souls. Just as divine justice found in my all-embracing humanity everything it should find in all souls, and together shared with me all the blessings it should have shared with all souls, so I find everything in these victim souls, and I share with them all the blessings that I possess. So the reason why God preserves the earth in this passage is because in each epoch, he chooses at least one soul, at least one, with whom to share all his blessings, and that must become his victim. We find this in the case of Margaret Mary, of Catherine Labouré, of Faustina Kowalska, of Louisa Picaretta. And the same goes for today. Who is the victim in this world, in this generation, now that Louisa is gone? If God chooses a victim in every epoch, who is it today? God chooses at least one. And we know them by the endorsements the Church appends to their writings that come from God. And there are several today that are alive that God has chosen to give themselves unconditionally to Him. And now, when it comes to our role, we are also invited by God to become victim souls in these end times as well. How do we know that? Well, we know it from Louisa's writings. To give you a few examples, and there are several I can share with you here, I refer you to one of Louisa's volumes. I'm going to pull it up now. Um, taken from Volume 2, October 7th, 1899. Here Jesus reveals that those who would reject his call and would be lost are not lost on account of those who intercede on their behalf. And God avails himself of these victim souls, not only to save souls, but to avoid wars, chastisements, and so forth. This is not only found in October 7th, 1899, Volume 2, but it's found in Volume 3 on March 20th, 1900, as well on June 10th, 1900, and in Volume 4, September 29th, 1900. To drive home this point more clearly, I want to share with you a passage that was taken from St. Hannibal de Francia's Meditation of the 8 p.m. Hour of the Passion. And from Louisa Picaretta's volume, 17, October 6, 1924. Now, let's start out with St. Hannibal. He states, let us suppose that Jesus places us in a situation in which we have to exercise patience. He receives so many offenses from souls that he feels driven to chastise them. It is here then that he gives us the occasion to practice patience, and we should honor him by enduring everything with patience, just as he endured it. Our patience will strip from his hands those chastisements that other souls force into them. After all, it is within us that he exercises his own divine patience. 
this not only applies to the virtue of patience, but to all the other virtues as well. So here St. Hannibal is stating that God is calling us, not just the mystics, but we, members of the mystical body of Christ in these end times, to allow Christ to exercise his virtues within us. And if we allow him to do so, he will withdraw his chastisements. So that means we're called to be victim souls as well in this sense. And Jesus reveals to Louisa on October 6, 1924, how beautiful it is to see a soul fusing itself in my will. As it fuses itself in my will, the created heartbeat takes its place and life in the uncreated heartbeat. That means our heart beats within God's paternal heart. And Jesus adds, and this heartbeat forms only one heart, flowing and beating together with the uncreated heartbeat. This is the greatest joy of the human heart, to beat in the eternal heartbeat of its creator. My will empowers it to make its flight, and the human heartbeat flings itself into the center of its creator. So in addition to the divine will impacting the soul in these end times and influencing it to offer up its will unconditionally to God on behalf of souls who bring down his chastisements. The divine will affect the soul's bodily faculties, not just spiritual. The Eternal Father wants to beat in our heart the sun to flow in our life, by the spirit to breathe in our breath. This is a formation in progress, making a person a victim soul. You see, God just not, does not simply choose us to be victims. He has to first form us. And this is how he does it. He indwells within us little by little with our consent. And then when he raises us up to give our fiat, unconditional fiat, to him, then he relies upon us and asks of us, without forcing us, but with our free will and consent, to participate in his work of redemption, whereby we, like the Virgin Mother, become co-redeemers with Christ. We also find this work of co-redemption in Again, the writings of Louisa. Um, I want to refer you to a passage that uh, is taken from, let me pull it up real, real quick. It's taken from volume 11, October 1914. In this passage, our Lord talks about the role we occupy in these end times of being victim souls through the meditation on the hours of the Passion that avert chastisements. To Louisa, Jesus states, these hours of the Passion are the most precious of all because they are the reenactment of what I did in the course of my mortal life and what I continue to do in the most blessed sacrament. When I hear these hours of my passion, I hear my own voice and my own prayers. In the soul I behold my will, that is, my will desiring the good of all and making reparation for all. Whence I feel drawn to dwell in the soul, to be able to do with it what the soul itself does. Oh, with what love I desire that at least one soul in each town meditate upon these hours. I would hear my own voice in each town, and my justice, greatly indignant in these times, would be placated in part. So you see, as we assimilate our thoughts with Jesus' passion while reading these hours of the passion, we progressively embrace the acts of all creatures and of all time by the power of God at work in us. 
And this assimilation engenders a sort of fusion with Jesus' humanity who restores to creations God's divine harmony. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 12, May 16, 1917, these hours are the order of the universe. Let me repeat that. These hours of my passion are the order of the universe. They put heaven and earth in harmony and restrain me from sending the world to ruin. I feel my blood, my wounds, my love, and all that I did circulating and flowing throughout all to save all. As souls meditate these hours of my passion, I feel my blood, my wounds, my anxieties to save souls ignited, and I feel my own life being repeated. How could souls obtain any benefit, if not by means of these hours? Why do you doubt? This is not your work, but mine. You are but the tempered and weak instrument. So here the soul, as I mentioned, co-redeems with Christ. And I mention this because Jesus says this to Louisa in volume 11, November 6, 1914. He says, my daughter, know that by doing these hours, the soul takes my thoughts and makes them its own. It takes my reparations, prayers, desires, affections, and even the most intimate fibers of my heart and makes them its own. And rising up between heaven and earth, it carries out my own office as and as co-redeemer, it says with me, Ecce me ego mite me, here I am, send me. I want to make reparation for all, to answer for all, and to beseech blessings for all. So you see, if God chooses at least one soul in each epoch to be a victim soul, to intercede on behalf of others, and to avert chastisements and wars and plagues like the coronavirus and other things from earth that come on account of human sinfulness and evil on account of human sinfulness, it doesn't mean that these victim souls are only mystics that have extraordinary phenomena, mystical phenomena. These victim souls can be the average Joe, the average Jane. They are you and me. Provided we welcome God into our lives and do not fear that if I give God my fiat, he will take everything from me and leave me without anything. No, this is not true. Whenever we say yes to God unconditionally, he gives us more of his riches. He will remove from us with our consent, never without our consent, the things that hinder the fullness of the divine will from taking root and from making our souls f- um, fruitful. He will remove from us with our consent only things that keep our souls from making its flight to heaven. I don't mean that we die, I mean that we become detached from things interiorly, even though exteriorly we make use of them. And he makes our souls fruition, fruitious, fruitful, and full of grace, so that we may administer this grace as co-redeemers with Christ to the race of which we belong. So meditating on these hours, vicariously immolating ourselves through these writings, with Jesus for the sins of mankind, enables us to acquire merit as if all were saved. Think of that. In volume 11, October 1914, Jesus Jesus, uh, will tell us this truth after Louisa introduces this passage to us. She writes, Another time I was complaining to Jesus, because after so many sacrifices in writing these hours of the Passion, very few souls were reading them, and he answered, My daughter, do not complain. Even if there were but one soul, you should be happy. Would I not have suffered my whole passion, even if only one soul were saved? It is the same for you. 
one should never omit good because few avail themselves of it. All harm awaits those who do not take advantage of it, though. And just as my passion made my humanity acquire the merit as if all were saved, as if as my will was to save everyone, although not all are saved, I received merit according to what I desired to accomplish and not according to the profit souls would draw from it. The same applies to you, Louisa. You will be rewarded according to how your will was united with my will in wanting to do good for all. So this is how we become victim souls. Even if all souls are not saved, which they are not, as Jesus reminds us here, we can still pray that all are saved, and on account of that prayer, receive the merit as if all were saved. Why? Because the graces we intercede for on behalf of souls are timeless and therefore can still apply today to them in the past while they are yet alive. This is how the timelessness of grace works. Think of the grace of Christ that redeemed all the Old Testament personages. Christ was conceived and born thousands of years after them, yet his grace of redemption was retroactive, proactive, and contemporaneous. It embraced the past, future, and present. The same applies to us. When we intercede with Christ in us on behalf of others, the graces that we obtain for them can apply to them thousands of years ago while yet they are alive, even though today they are long gone. How is this possible, if not by the divine and eternal mind of God who foresees all things before they happen? So Christ has already foresaw our acts today that we have yet to perform in this day. He has already foreseen every act of every human until the end of time, and he has already seen where they go, heaven, hell, or purgatory. He knows all things, God, and yet he wants it to play out in time in our respective human natures. Therefore, let's take, for example, someone from 3000 B.C., God had already applied to that individual 5,000 years ago the prayers we are saying today. But God cannot give them the gift of living in the divine will because this gift, the reception of this gift is not retroactive or it is only given to those in these end times. So even though we may pray for a soul to be saved that died 3,000 years ago, and God will apply our prayers to them while they are alive 3,000 years ago, and in fact already has, it does not mean we can intercede that they receive the gift of living in the divine will. Because as Jesus reveals to Louisa, the dispensation and actualization of God's gifts are restricted to certain epochs in human history. Every 2,000 years, God dispenses by means of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit extraordinary gifts. But even though these gifts are not retroactive, our prayers are in the divine will only. So saints in the past could not retroactively apply their prayers to souls before them, but we can, because this propensity to do so comes not from human nature, not from Christian virtue, but from the gift of living in the divine will. Now, these hours of the Passion are important in these end times, and we can never overemphasize their timeliness and importance. Inasmuch as we are called to be victim souls, we have an obligation to give our fiat to God, but this all depends upon our own capacity. 
we should never throw away everything, abandon everything in the absolute sense of the word and go devote ourselves exclusively to the divine will without first consulting with a good spiritual director, without consulting with church teaching. Because there have been extremists in the history of the church that had claimed to have been ordered by God to leave everything and to form a community and it turns into a sect. And they start receiving revelation and prophecies that are false. Claiming that the end of the world is in... um, 2022, 2025, 2028, and they all prove false. So far they all have. Because only the Son of God knows the day and the hour for the final return. But the final return is not until way off past the era of peace. But we do not know the dates, the times, the seasons. Why do we not know them? Because, again, prophecy depends upon our conversion or lack thereof, and therefore can be either forestalled, eliminated, or accelerated. And inasmuch as we are called to be victim souls, we ought to give our fear to God in our own capacity. Inasmuch as the soul of Jesus' blessed mother was unceasingly united to that of Jesus, So we, members of the body of Christ in these end times, who meditate on the hours, also reenact what Jesus' mother did on earth. So when we become victim souls, what we're doing is we're not only inviting the Trinity within us, the heartbeat of the Father within us, the lifeblood of the Son within us, the breath of the Spirit within us, we're inviting Mary within us, too. Remember, Jesus and Mary are inseparable. In volume 11, October 1914, Louisa relates, I wish to add that one day I was doing the hour in which our Heavenly Mother had laid Jesus in the tomb. And I followed her to keep her company in her bitter desolation to offer her my compassion. I did not usually do this hour all the time, just sometimes. Now, I was undecided as to whether I should do it or not, and blessed Jesus, full of love, and as if beseeching me, said, My daughter, I do not want you to omit this hour. You will do it for love of me, in honor of my mother. Know that every time you do this hour, my mother feels as if she were on earth in person, reenacting her life. And therefore she receives the glory and love she gave me while on earth. And I feel as if my mother were on earth again. So I will consider you as a mother. So these hours of the passion are really connected to our role, our vocation as victim souls in God's economy of salvation. Through the meditation on these hours, we attain not only the grace to help save souls and avert chastisement, but to overcome our own weakness and defects. Take, for example, volume 13, October 21st, 1921. Jesus reveals, for as many times as the soul desires, it can receive the fruit of my life. So if the soul remembers my passion 20 times, 100 times, or a 1,000 times, so many times does it enjoy its effects. My pains, my wounds, my blood become for the soul the strength that removes its weakness, light that gives sight to the blind, speech that loses, loosens tongues and opens the hearing. Legs that make the crippled stand straight. Life that raises the dead. All the remedies needed for all humanity are in my life and in my passion. And these hours of the passion also influence and accompany all souls that pass through purgatory and enter heaven. For as Jesus tells Louisa, There is not a soul who enters purgatory without carrying the mark of the hours of the passion 
And there is not a soul who makes its flight to heaven without being accompanied by these hours of the Passion. This comes from volume 12, May 16th, 1917. Now, many of us have many obligations, but this should not be an obstacle to us in keeping our minds focused on the Passion of Christ. Even though our domestic obligations do not allow us to continuously and attentively meditate these hours all the time, we may substitute, as I mentioned a few few segments ago, we may substitute the disposition of our good will with that of Jesus to continuously meditate them and intercede for the salvation of all souls. And as I mentioned a few segments ago, the substitution, asking Jesus to pray on our behalf, even our guardian angel to do so, if we have to apply our attention to something else, is found in volume 12, May 16, 1917. So, oh, I'm sorry, it's found in um, the 6 p.m. hour of the Passion, where St. Hannibal offers a reflection. And it's found in volume 12, February 10th, 1919. One more passage I wish to share in this regard, and before going back to the theme of victim souls and our call to be victims with Christ and co-redeemers with Christ is from volume 11, October 1914. Jesus reveals, My daughter, the prayers offered with me and with my own will can be given to all. No one is excluded. All receive their part in their effects, as if these prayers had been offered for one soul alone. However, they operate according to the dispositions of each soul, as with communion or as with my passion. I give them to each and every one, but their effects are produced according to the dispositions of each soul. And if only five souls were to receive them, their effects would not be inferior to those of ten who should receive them. Such is the prayer offered with me and with my will. So, God is calling us to become one with him in his state of victimhood, but in a joyful sense. Remember, Louisa received the grace of baptism of victimhood. She received the nuptials of the cross, the nuptials on earth, and the nuptials in heaven. And what is this baptism of victimhood? Well, let's start with redemption, where it finds its roots. Through redemption, Jesus reordered man's interior by forming within his humanity the life of his passion. In his redemptive passion, he assumed all human acts in order to make reparation and offer satisfaction for them, and he also sanctified them. And he formed the life of his passion in Louisa too. This is found in volume 11, November 20th, 1914. He tells her, I have given you two very great things, which one can say formed my own life. My life was enclosed in these two points, divine will and divine love. Divine will carried out my life in me and accomplished my passion. I want nothing else from you, Louisa, but for my will to be your life and your rule, and that you not escape from it in the slightest thing, be it great or small. This will shall carry out my passion in you. And the closer you stay to my will, the more you will feel my passion within you. If you let my will flow within you as your very life, my will shall make my passion also flow in you. So you will feel it flowing in each one of your thoughts, in your mouth. You will feel your tongue immersed in it, and your word will issue forth warmed by my blood whereby you may speak eloquently of my pains, etc. So here he, he says that he forms the life of his passion in her for the purpose of mediating divine mercy and satisfying the divine justice on behalf of mankind. Now, Louise's vicarious meditations 
and sufferings. Or in vehicle through which Jesus placed her in the center of his humanity, where he would renew in her his stigmatic soul, his salvific pains. And this was for a time only. He would alternate his divine sufferings with those of her own sufferings to expiate and to make reparation for the sins of mankind. Now, Jesus refers to this extreme participation in his divine sufferings as a, in Louisa, as a baptism of victimhood, which is a baptism by fire, because it possesses the grace of purging and consuming evil tendencies, and it constitutes a martyrdom of love that surpasses all other martyrdoms. Jesus tells Louisa in volume 12, March 14th, 1920, My daughter, you are the hardest martyrdom, the harshest pain for my heart. Every time I see you moaning, petrified by the pain of my privation, my martyrdom becomes all the more bitter. Now, this privation of Jesus means he's not appearing to her. And remember, Louisa was bedridden. She really had not much company. And to her, Jesus was her entire reason for living and also the bane of her existence, because she was persecuted by her own church for claiming she was receiving revelations and talking with from Jesus and talking to him. But whenever he deprived himself of her presence, which he did on purpose, it caused her tremendous pain. She was petrified with pain from his absence. And he did this so that she might offer up this suffering to help save souls. And it was a martyrdom that she freely welcomed. Now, Jesus does not call us to this in same intensity of pain of martyrdom that he called Louisa or that he called his blessed mother to. Rather, we're called to participate in just some small portion of his passion that Mary and Louisa participated in. And he he does not violate our free will. God waits for us to offer our will and in the measure in which we offer it. So don't be afraid to give your fiat to God. God knows your limitations. He knows your capacity. He knows your needs and obligations, and he will never violate them. This is a consistent teaching of not only the mystics, but of the saints. The devil puts into us a false idea that if we give our unconditional fiat to God, he will take everything from us and leave us destitute. This is a lie, and it comes from hell. And it keeps us from giving our unconditional fiat to God. And you should get rid of that thought if you have it. Like Louis de Montfort, we should say, fiat. Right? What was totus tuus fiat sunt, et omnibus rebus fiat. He said, and Pope John Paul II took this expression as his moniker, that everything, I am all yours, Mary, and everything I have is yours, Mary. And do you think Mary took everything from Louis de Montfort and left him destitute? Absolutely not. On the contrary, he was provided for more than he needed. People were giving him offerings left and right, and he built this beautiful Via Crucis in France. That later on the bishop had taken down, but years after the bishop's death, it was re, re resurrected. But the point is, if we give ourselves unconditionally to God, he will provide us more than he does now. This is the truth. But he will also give us the grace to participate ordinately in that which he shares with us. I want to remind you at this point to continue to support this wonderful radio program of Radio Maria that brings you the sublime teachings of the doctrines of the divine will, that extends to you sound Catholic, moral, dogmatic, spiritual, theological teachings, magisterial teachings, traditional teachings. You know, some people ask me, Father Joseph, are you a conservative? Are you an ultra-conservative? Are you a moderate? Are you a liberal? 
are you an ultra liberal? What are you? As if you know, priests could be limited within these five categories, or much less the laity. And you know, I sometimes with tongue in cheek laugh at such a question because people like to compartmentalize not just things but human beings too. And it's unfair to put any one person in any one of these compartments. Number one, it's not a it's not a compliment. Number two, it's very reductionary. What do I mean by that? Let me share with you what Bishop Sheen said, Archbishop Fulton Sheen. He did not like calling anyone a conservative or a liberal, and he had good reason for saying that. Number one, because the Holy Spirit is very generous and free and flowing like the water. Or like the air, as Jesus said, the spirit moves like the wind. You don't see where it comes from or where it goes. So it's not conserved to one place, the Holy Spirit. It's moving constantly, exfusing gifts constantly, renewing constantly, purifying constantly, divinizing constantly. And then we have the work of creation, which is fixed. And God reveals this to Louisa. So the Father's work in creation is established once and for all. Certainly things reproduce and multiply, and man through technology can, can you know, produce some hybrid offspring and things like that. But what God has established does not change. So on the one hand, you can say that creation is conserved to what God intended. But the work of sanctification is not conserved to one specific expression. It's open to a plethora of expressions. Otherwise put, in answer to the question of whether or not I'm an ultra-conservative, conservative, moderate, liberal, ultra-liberal, my answer is this. I am very orthodox in my theology. Because doctrine does not change. But I am very unorthodox in my spirituality because the expression of doctrine is never the same. It always changes. And this is why the Holy Spirit has continued to give to us different expressions of our unchanging doctrine. Through whether it be the um, traditional mass, the charismatic gifts and renewal, the... Um, neocatechumenal movement, the Focalarini movement, the um, different religious expressions of the unchanging doctrine of Christ, whether it's the Franciscan, the Dominican, the Jesuit, the Benedictine, etc. These are all different expressions of unchanging doctrine of Christ. The divine will is also an expression of the one unchanging doctrine of Christ. And if you call yourself only a conservative or an ultra-conservative, you will not accept the gift of living in the divine will in many cases because you don't believe that anything that comes from God can come after Christ. You see, so it's not a compliment to say that you're either completely conservative or completely moderate or completely liberal. That's reductionary. You have to be open to new expressions that come from the Holy Spirit of worshiping the one God who doesn't change. But the expression, the manner of our worship changes with every season. There are two Ds in the church, discipline and doctrine. Discipline changes, doctrine does not. Discipline regulates our external worship. So the church has the authority to regulate external worship, which is our expression of the unchanging doctrine of Christ. And this is called discipline, the one D, without ever changing the second D, the doctrine of Christ. So we must all be open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the gifts are known in Latin as the charismata. which is where we get the word charismatic from. 
But yet we have to also be very grounded in the unchanging doctrine of Christ. And this is where the word deposit comes from, the deposit of faith. So with that in mind, I invite you all to be very orthodox in your theology, but very unorthodox in your spirituality. And if you are, you will be open to allow the Holy Spirit in these end times and the Blessed Mother to form you and invite you to become co-redeemers, victim souls with Christ. With, as Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, a smile on your face, while joyfully bearing the cross of Christ for the salvation of souls, the sanctification of the world, and the hastening of the era of peace and of the divine will. We are all called to prepare and dispose the world for this era by being victim souls, co-redeemers with Christ. May God bless you and keep you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.